Welcome everyone. Good afternoon to everyone in the Eastern Time Zone and good morning to those of you in the Central Time Zone. Welcome to this month's edition of the Wild Wednesday webinar, Apothecary Products, the uh, Michigan-based and Minnesota-based of lanyards, pillboxes, and earplugs, and lots of uh, interesting uh, healthcare type items. Um, and they have generously sponsored the uh, webinar. Continuing today with uh, product safety with Tim Brown from AI. Before we get started, I'd like to uh, point out that on the left side of your screen, you'll see that you can click on a copy of Tim's presentation. Uh, also, you'll see a chat box there. If you have any questions uh, throughout the presentation, uh, feel free to type them in. Um, I will be monitoring that. Uh, going to try to hold most of the questions to the end, but if it's a question I feel needs to be addressed immediately, I'll, I'll interrupt Tim and, and point out your question. Uh, also, if you'd like to get the S credits for today's uh, webinar, at the end of the presentation, there's a, a survey to go to your end meeting. Um, we'll get that and submit that to PPAI. If for some reason you have a problem, my name is Paul Kiwi, and my email is paul at mipa.org, that's M-I-P-P-A dot I just need your PIN number, um, and I can take care of that for you. Uh, if you don't know a member of one of the other regional associations, uh, your executive director can get that information for you. So without any further ado, Tim uh, Brown is the uh, product safety guru for, for PPAI. He's been traveling throughout Tree to all of the regionals with a new initiative called Procti Aware. Uh, PPA has seen the importance of this particular issue, not only to protect our industry, which it's very critical to do that, but to also protect our, our customers, our customers' brands, and of course, the ultimate end user. So without any further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Tim. Tim, take it away. Thank you, Paul, uh, and thanks for inviting me here today as well as uh, to your show coming up here, the Ideas in Bloom show. Um, wanted to let everybody know that this is today's session is part of a, it's part one of a four part session and we'll be completing the additional three parts at um, the, the, in conjunction with the show. And those four parts combined will get you your product safety aware status and we'll go further into product safety at the end and uh, kind of give you an idea of what that's about if you're not already aware. As Paul said, I'm Tim Brown. I currently hold my MAS, which was obtained when I was uh, with a, a distributor in the industry. I did uh, vendor relations there. Uh, and when I left, prior to coming to PPAI, I did some consulting in the industry regarded to uh, sourcing and compliance as it relates to our industry. So um, again, thank, me, thank you, Paul. I appreciate the time. Uh, today's program, everyone, is going to actually lay the groundwork. I said this is part one. so. The, the sessions that we'll talk about at the next, uh, or, or at the show, will go much more in depth into some of the, the information you guys need. Before I get in started here, I have to read this disclaimer. Uh, the information I'm furnishing today is for educational and informational purposes only. Uh, the association makes no warnings or representations about specific dates, coverages, or applications. Uh, we advise you to consult with appropriate legal counsel about the specific applications of the law to your business and products. So with that out of the way, uh, let's, let's dive in here. Uh, this session, I'm gonna let you know, typically runs about an hour and a half. I'm gonna do my best to get it done in an hour. Uh, and I've asked Paul to kind of task me with that. It is hard, it's designed as an hour and a half session, but uh, I'll do my best to get through as quick as we can uh, and, and respect everyone's time. So uh, with that, uh, Here's the agenda. Here's the things we're gonna kind of cover today. We, uh, we're gonna let you know what you need to know, why you need to know it, how you can get started is all this stuff with product responsibility. And uh, we'll use some, some uh, different case studies, so to speak, and, and some resources that can help you uh, through this stuff. So I guess, you know, kind of why, why are we doing this, I guess? Uh, one, it's the law, two, um, that uh, end buyers, especially larger companies, are demanding more from our industry and uh, consumer goods in general. Um, the, uh, uh, 
units, whether it's social, environmental, or product responsibility, all of those are, are global challenges these days. And it's whether it's a state law, a federal law, we're, we're continually um, seeing more and more regulations that we need to, to abide by. And our industry makes it increasingly difficult for people from the standpoint that we take products that uh, were intended for one use, and by virtue of the logo and the audience, then we transform it into something that it originally wasn't intended for. And so laws that, and regulations that may originally not have applied uh, now do. And so as, a res as an industry, we have a responsibility uh, to our end buyers, uh, their customers, uh, and, and everyone involved, and in, in recipients of products, uh, wherever you are in the supply chain. And I kind of already touched on that a bit. We are in the brand protection business. You know, the compliance with the regulations really isn't optional. It doesn't matter if your customers aren't asking for it now. The law is the law. Um, but if you, the sooner you get on board with this and the sooner you jump on it, whether supplier or distributor, you can increase your strategic value um, to, to your customers. Uh, you can increase your strategic value compared to your competitors because those that are not using this as a selling uh, opportunity are, are missing out on some good business where uh, – All I got a message saying the audio is not working. Um, <clears throat> that message has come up on my screen. Can someone indicate in the chat box if they're hearing the audio? I'm hearing you fine. I'm going to plow um, through then. I'm which, not sure what that message is. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, All right. Drops uh, and one person asked. Okay, um, you know, picking up where we left off there, you know, procure, procure, uh, procurement agents in our category are uh, typically view promo as a commodity. They really don't understand its place or its value, the order details, creativity, and everything that goes uh, into it that, that you create value with. They typically look at the cost only, um, and they break down the, the shipping, warehousing, fulfillment, and those types of things, but they miss out on compliance and the creativity uh, and, and the problem solving that uh, and, and marketing opportunities that you provide. Um, in spite of their focus a lot of times on RFP, you know, on, on the cost, RFPs can be a great way, you know, to, to prove your value. It's an opportunity for you to demonstrate the merit of what you do as a company and what the industry does as far as creativity, attention to detail, uh, product qualities, uh, management of an order process, uh, the, the, the product is a marketing medium. Um, so, you know, take advantage of that to, to you know, to uh, really showcase what we do. You know, a quick example is, you know, people that want a Jaguar do not haggle over the price of a Jaguar. You know, they want it for the perceived value, the driving experience, the joy of being behind that wheel. You know, if you're buying that, you just generally don't question the cost understand the value so it, you're it, at the same time there's certain quality aspects that come along with that and are perceived and we as an industry need to do a good job or a better job of relating that message and compliance can help do that no matter where you're at in the supply chain and contrary to popular belief uh, by many distributors this is not just a supplier issue the suppliers, yes, they're either making the product or importing the product, and much of the responsibility follows, falls to them. But distributors have a responsibility as well. They have a responsibility to, to protect the customer's brand. We say, you know, act as if it was your own. You are the brand protector. Now, the way I like to put it is often if you, every order you accept from a customer, whether it's a, a small pen order uh, to, to a large incentive type, uh, order or everything in between, shirts, drinkware, bags, whatever you're, you're, you're selling, the minute you accept that order, they've entrusted their brand's reputation and integrity to you, and you represent our industry as well. So who you work with, how you purchase it, what you, um, uh, what you require uh, in the products that you're providing to them, 
uh, you're just as responsible. And, and if there's ever an incident, everyone in the supply chain will be viewed responsible. You can't just shove it down to the suppliers. So while a lot of it does fall there, uh, distributors, you still have a responsibility and an obligation in how you conduct your business. Uh, and, and also, the end user, they're not out of this. If you have the conversation with an end user and tell them, hey, here's the regulations based on this application for this product and, and how you're distributing it, and they refuse to heed that, uh, they essentially, in a sense, have um, decided that they're going to go against the law. So um, they have a responsibility to those that they hand the product out to as well. One thing I want to touch before we get into too much here is um, as far as we you know, typically the supplier in our industry and the typical supply chain is uh, suppliers and manufacturer. Whether they're making the product themselves or importing a finished product from overseas, the importer of record in the eyes of the Consumer Product Safety Commission is the manufacturer. So they're responsible for all, you know, for the initial stages and, and, and much of what we've talked about so far and we'll talk about further as far as the responsibility for compliance. But 29% of distributors in our industry, it is estimated, do source direct in some way, shape, or form. I know that's, uh, it goes against a lot of the, the, the ideals, but the truth is that it happens. And when a distributor sources direct, they become the manufacturer, not necessarily the broker they're dealing with. That's just the intermediary. The person responsible for bringing it into the country, they are the manufacturer. And so everything, every detail that would typically fall to a supplier, an experienced supplier in our industry, you as a distributor take on. And so when we're walking through this today and you look at that, if you source direct in any way, you need to decide if that's really the um, responsibility you want to have or if you'd rather outsource that to someone. I'm not telling you how to do your business. I'm just mentioning that these are definitely things you want to consider. Uh, and another part is, as a distributor, when you source from a uh, third-party contract decorator, you become the manufacturer. So when, we, when you take a T-shirt and you take it from one of the larger wholesalers, um, while you know, the, the brand is, is essentially or the wholesaler is responsible for the compliance of the garment itself blank, when you take it somewhere else and you request that it be changed uh, or modified in any way, which is what we do, you become the manufacturer. So you need to work closely with decorators that can provide you uh, appropriate documentation for products, and then you're responsible for holding on to everything that the supplier typically would in that instance. This side kind of, slide kind of sums it up. You know, everything is good and bad just about, or most things are good and bad in some way. Too much of a good thing is a bad thing. So when we're talking about uh, these regulations and the, um, uh, the, the chemical contents and the limits and, and those types of things, you know, there's, there's, there's plenty of things out there that are good for us. It's just once you get to the, the size of it, the dose or, or, or excess, that's where there's a problem. So, you know, at the, on the surface, the laws that we have and, and that are being implemented, as much grief as they cause us, on the surface, the intent is good, and I can, I, I can get on board with that. But the, the trouble we face is that they're not implemented well, they're not clear, and, and tend to, while I'm talking chemicals go over, you know, the, the content of chemicals can be bad in, in excess. So can not provide in the right direction or overkill without understanding the unintended consequences. Unfortunately for us, we have to foresee those unintended or live with those unintended consequences of the law. And um, that's what we're going to try to help clear up for you guys today. So it all started in 2007 with the year of the recall. I'm going to give you some quick examples of some things that really pushed all of this. Um, you know, Prop 65 is one issue, Consumer Product Safety Improvement Act is another issue, and then there's a myriad of other state international laws as well. But as far as the Consumer Product Safety Improvement Act is concerned, uh, in 2007 we had a lot of things. It was basically the result of squeezing for price and not paying attention to everything else. Uh, you know, price was keen and then responsibility uh, was not adhered to or, or taken by many. So in 2000, uh, 
six, really, right before all this happened, 187 people became sick, and at least one died after eating uh, bagged spinach tainted with E. coli. Uh, this was this outbreak was actually traced to a processing plant in California and led to the recall of multiple brands. Additionally, in 2007, many of you are probably aware of the fact, or at least had heard of the peanut butter recalls. Um, Peanut Butter Corporation of America issued a recall of all its bulk peanut butter on fears of sal salmonella contamination. Um, but because the bulk peanut butter was used as an ingredient in thousands of other packaged goods, this escalated into a recall that was soon expanded to include 3,918 different food products. Uh, so a recall or an incident uh, on an item in our industry where we sell thousands it could have originated with just one simple product, and you never know how far it's going to escalate or affect something. Um, additionally, here we have the, the, the wagon train jerky tenders. You know, the, the FDA had issued uh, three warnings about the chicken jerky products, but has not issued a recall because so far incidents, so scientists haven't really been able to determine a precise cause for reported illnesses from using this product. But the FDA has issued the following statement. Uh, regarding dog treats, uh, it says FDA has been testing chicken jerky treats since 2007 as a report of, result of reports of illness in dogs that may be associated with eating the treats. The FDA is actively investigating the matter and conducting analysis for multiple different chemical and microbiological contaminants. So they're getting involved in this, even though they still haven't been able to get to the source. It's another issue that uh, has arisen. Uh, and these are just some examples. You know, melamine tainted baby, baby formula killed four infants and resulted in the hospitalization of thousands more. And we know that melamine products are used within our industry. Um, melamine is an industrial chemical that had been reportedly added to diluted milk products in an effort to make them appear to be higher in protein than they actually were. And later that contamination was found to be widespread in the Chinese dairy supply, leading to a blanket recall of nearly all the liquid milk in their country. Uh, another one we can talk about is uh, Easy Bake Ovens. These were recalled in 2007 after the government said it received hundreds of reports of children getting their hands stuck inside the toys opening, which is, in some cases resulted in second or third degree burns. Uh, over five, well, one five-year-old girl was burned severely enough by the toy that she had to have one of her fingers partially amputated. Um, and another, the uh, moth larvae were found crawling uh, out of holes of Chinese counterfeit chocolates. And keep that in mind while we're talking food here. We have a lot of counterfeit uh, pro potential for counterfeit products within our industry, uh, as well as all retail has potential for that. But when you're making custom items and your you know, things like that, you need to understand patents and copyright laws and things like that and work with reputable companies to avoid uh, things like this. Thomas the Train make, it made a great deal of news. Uh, 1.5 million Thomas the Train wooden railroad road to toys were recalled in 2007 after paint on the toys was found to contain lead, uh, and which is toxic and if ingested, in particular harmful to children under the age of six. And lead's a big thing with the Consumer Product Safety Information Improvement Act that we are, are going to discuss today. And the biggest one, most well-known of them all, was uh, Mattel. Uh, Mattel really, they uh, they had give they, they had previously given manufacturers in China a list of eight paint suppliers that they could use, but in order to cut costs, subcontract on suppliers. So in this case, you had a, a a company doing the right thing, but unbeknownst to them, who they contracted with did not. Um, and in some cases, the lead content in the uh, unapproved paint was 800 and time 108 times the legal limit. So. Uh, this this caused immense problems, and we really need to learn from these examples uh, within our in industry. Here's a, just a quick timeline. I talked about escalating uh, on a recall. You can just look at this. I'm not going to go through it, but what I am going to talk about in, in conjunction with it is, you know, today we're dealing with multiple uh, technology product type recalls. Technology products are leading our industry, or are a leading product now in our industry. Uh, and there's been recalls on battery chargers, battery ad adapters, and so forth. 
And, you know, there's really, up to this point, been a lack of awareness and, and attention paid to what the regulations are for these types of products. So these recalls are now uh, putting a, a spotlight on this. And, uh, you know, we'll specifically, actually, we have our product safety summit coming up uh, in Boston in August, and we have a session specifically dedicated to technology products and how, how to deal with them. So if you get a chance, you may wait, want to consider attending that, uh, that summit. But uh, those are something that while we are not going to talk about the tech products here today in this session, be aware, and those products are, um, uh, the recalls have hit our industry. So the Consumer Product Safety Improvement Act, touched about it, was passed by Congress in 2008. It has been called the most comprehensive overhaul of a consumer product safety law since the CPSC was actually created. Uh, they deem it a victory for parents and consumers. And again, like I said earlier, while this, uh, on the surface, I'm 100% I'm this is great, I can agree with the, the intent. The, the application and, and the um, implementation of it uh, has, has not been so much so, but we're, like I said, we're, we have to deal with it and figure this out. Um, what it applies to, this really applies to uh, the C children's products, their child care articles and toys. Uh, and, and the way the CPSIA defines this is a child 12 years old and younger. So uh, they have to become 13. This isn't under 12. This is 12 years old and under these things apply to. In some cases, uh, and I'll mention it later, uh, you get into a 14-year limit, but I'll talk about where that specifically applies. Uh, the requirements we're going to address then through this are third-party testing. It is mandatory for children's products. The lead in the substrates, the lead in paint and surface coatings, and some phthalates. Uh, children's products certificates are mandatory, and we'll discuss those, as well as tracking labels are mandatory. Um, I know that uh, it seems ridiculous at times. I, I've, I've heard it all, but they are mandatory, and we figure out how to deal with them. And yes, that is even in a children's youth T-shirt that we decorate. Um, and changes also made previously voluntary rules and standards. The CPSIA made them now mandatory. Uh, this is a quick snapshot, high line of a high level view of what we're concerned about um, and what, what uh, you're, you're, you're dealing with. We'll talk about the, the parts per million in paints and surface coatings, as well as the substrates on a product uh, and different bands. And, you know, and this isn't just the decorator products. You have to think about small parts, uh, whether it's in the product or if it's bling on a T-shirt. You have to be aware of uh, choking hazards and small parts uh, bands. So lead and substrates, the substrates are material that the product is actually made of. So it's, it's, it's the actual hard parts of the products, could be the soft parts of the product. It is the product itself. Um, the, uh, the old law previous to all this, it was 600 parts per million were the requirements. And then through this, it was uh, driven down to 300 parts per million than 100 parts per million in the substrate. So 100 parts where we're at today, um, third-party testing by an approved Consumer Product Safety Commission lab will um, uh, determine whether a product meets that. But as of January 1st, 2012, the, uh, the, the 100 parts per million requirement has it's been, um, I'm sorry, 2011, that has been uh, enacted, so it's, and it's mandatory. Um, there is, there, there's uh, component testing and, and different ways that this can be handled, but from a supplier perspective, um, you know, when you, when you can do different types of testing, they, they allow for you to take the same test account for six different uh, buttons, so to speak. So say, for example, the same button used on one, on six different children's garments is the same button used across those, the one test would go across the board for all of those those buttons, uh, not just, you don't have to test for each different garment they go on. Um, so, uh, and, and composite testing of like materials is also allowed with cer certain parameters to ensure that no failure could, could go undetected. Um, surface coatings are the other issue, um, and that's where we get to a, a, a 90 parts per million limit. 
uh, this is our decoration, folks. This is the the and the inks and anything that we paint on a product. So while it's the it's the paint that could be applied to the product as well as any of the decorations we use, the requirement is 90 parts per million. Uh, if it can be scraped off, uh, in some cases where it becomes part of the item, whereas it may infuse with reds and become part of the product, that could make it more of the substrate type regulation, and you would need to work with your test labs or uh, suppliers to, to verify those types of things. But for most, uh, all incidences, uh, the, uh, the paint in surface coatings is a, a 90 parts per million, so that's your inks. the slide here. So thiolates. Thiolates are basically plasticizers. These, these soften plastics. And there are some uh, interim bans and, uh, out there right now. Uh, the CPSIA regulates thiolates in children's toys and child care articles. Thiolates are mainly used in plasticizers to increase the flexibility, the longevity, and dur durability in all toys intended for use by children. And I mentioned earlier the 14 years of age um, must comply with the federal uh, toy safety standard in, in, enacted by the Consumer Product Safety Improvement Act. The toy safety standard covers toys and toy chests designed for use by children 14 years age, of age and under, or yeah, 14 years of age and under. So that's that deviation from that 12 year old that we talked about. Uh, currently there's six, six thylates currently under either a permanent or interim ban on that ban applies to toys and child care articles, not necessarily to the children's products. Child care articles are defined as consumer products that are designed or intended by the manufacturer for a child who's three years old or younger to facilitate sleeping, feeding, um, sucking, or teething. Um, it ban the ban applies to bibs and sleepwear, as well as teethers, teethers, pacifiers, sippy cups, high chairs, cribs, and other infant items. The good news is that the ban is really it applies to accessible materials only. It no longer applies to the inaccessible or the hidden components of the item. So it's what is it can be touched and handled and mounted on the outside. Um, and one caveat: there's uh, been some discussion in Congress, and there's uh, they're looking and reviewing all this. That some of these interim bans uh, are looking to, to make uh, permanent mandatory bans going forward here, we're real close to that, uh, as well as adding additional thylates to those six. So stay, stay tuned for more information there. But there are some exemptions from this. There's wood, paper, keep in mind CMYK printing ink, uh, some gemstones, natural plant fibers, some animal products. There's a list of everything. Uh, we have this information on our website as well as um, or access to it to the Consumer Product Safety Commission's website. And so I won't go into all of that today, um, but uh, there are exemptions. And there's also exemptions that apply to textiles, but it excludes the after-treatment applications such as screen prints and transfers, decals, and other prints. And if the after uh, treatment applications are scrapable, they may fall under the lead and paint requirement. If they're not, the lead test content testing may apply. Um, so you have different ways to look at that. You know, if you intend to really rely on the exempted uh, statutes, you, you must have completed some sort of reasonable due diligence with your supplier or manufacturer to assure that you've correctly understood the nature of the print being used or the product. Otherwise, the test testing to determine compliance should be performed as all products must meet the certified uh, certified to full compliance. So don't just look at it and say, oh, it's wood, it, it doesn't apply, it's a gemstone. Notice I have certain gemstones. Just do your homework. An important thing to note here is that embroidery threads in and of themselves, with the exception of metallic and a few others, but the majority of embroidery threads themselves are exempt from testing. So that brings us to children's products. There's general conformity certificates, or for, which are general use items, and there's consumer product safety, or consumer product certificates. One we call a GPC more commonly, and the other we call a CPC. Uh, the CPCs are required for all children's products. The Consumer Product Safety Commission states that certification means the issuance of a written GCC or CPC in which the manufacturer or importer certifies that it's non-children's 
general use. Um, but it's not children's products, so the general use where a GC is required and it's children's products where a CPC is required complies with all applicable uh, consumer product safety rules or similar bans, standards, and regulations uh, under the control of the commission. This must be created by the manufacturer in order of record and is a distributor with new, with, with new uh, outsourced decorating of a t-shirt to the uh, decorator or if you insert uh, source directly. And then what I'm saying by that is go directly over uh, with something that's a very large order. You bypass the supply chain. You go overseas, order it directly. Become the manufacturer for uh, of a record. Um, for a sample of this, you can go to our website or the GPS website. We have a lot of information uh, there. There's no set way that this has to be handled. But here, and it's a little blurry as some of the uh, information that uh, is required on that, but there's no specific form as long as the information uh, listed here, and again, you, um, since I'll be switching the page, it will be available on my website or you can download the presentation up on your left. It uh, has the information that is uh, required there. In addition, we have a best practice on our website that walks you through how to create these. Uh, and tracking labels. Tracking labels, this is another critical compliance topic and area of confusion in our industry that, has to, that uh, everyone seems to grapple with. Permanent tracking labels are mandatory for all children's products under the CPSIA. And, and with children's apparel, generally two tracking labels are required. One for the garment itself when you buy it, and the manufacturer takes care of providing you that. Um, and they usually will have this indicated on the product itself. But then the minute you decorate it, you've made a material change, and a second uh, a tracking label is needed from that because of the, the, that would apply to the decoration part of the product. Uh, you're not responsible, you know, denial for having a f final um, test of retesting the whole product. You take the test reports from the ink suppliers, the test report from the manufacturer, and you can rely on those as long as they can. Um, so there has been some confusion about that, that people think they have to um, uh, go and, and, and create that information or do another test. That's not half to that if you have all documents required. Um, they must be permanent. Uh, hang tags and adhesives are not acceptable. In the case of the CPSIA, and when we're talking children's products, it has to be a per permanently on the product. Um, the supplier needs to include this. In most cases, the suppliers take care of it in our industry. Just remember the exceptions that I talked about. And this all depends on the changes made to the product. The distributor you know, may need to include additional tracking label or marketings for uh, hazard assessments, you have the bling, uh, whether it's gemstones or other types of, there's there's plenty to uh, address there. And if you have questions, you can ha you're free to call us anytime uh, to come back to us at um, uh, PPAI and we can help guide you through it or put you in touch with the right people or our lab partner at UL. So I'm going to switch off of Consumer Product Safety Improvement Act now. We're going to touch briefly on Proposition 65. We have a session that we're going to do at the MIP Ideas and Bloom show that delves deeper into Prop 65 and uh, other state regulations as well. So this is the primer. This covers the, the high level, uh, and keep that in mind as we go through it. Uh, several states have their own regulations in place for, for things like BPA, level, level, uh, labeling, and cadmium. Uh, lead, you know, like I said, lead, other products. So we're we're going to go deeper into that for their sessions. Uh, but the most widely known in our industry right now is the California Prop 65, and it's uh, it's California Proposition 65. We typically refer to it as Prop 65. Uh, it addresses the use of currently over 900 plus chemicals. And when we go back to 2007, when I mentioned that, there were 600 chemicals on the list at that time. So now we're here in 2014, we're looking at 900 plus, and it's growing every day. Um, so it's a good idea to stay on top of that. Um, but we're going to talk about how it affects you guys and, and, and what, how we can realistically deal with this. Uh, at the end of the day, it's it's important to understand that these are for when you're shipping into California. 
So if you have a large national client and you sometimes ship into California or if you're dealing through your website shipping into California as a distributor, you need to be aware of this. All suppliers should be aware of it. Um, so what it basically says is unless a product has been tested for those 900 chemicals, it requires a warning label. So you're not expected, I want to alleviate any fears, you do not have, um, not have to test for all 900. Um, as long, if, if, if you are appropriate labeling, that also meets requirements of the law. Uh, additional regulations that are out there that you just need to be aware of, and we do cover them in sessions more in depth, but the FDA has particularly, uh, 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 particular laws as they, that affect our industry. Uh, drinkware, sunscreen, lip balm, um, obviously the food, uh, all those things. You need to be working with suppliers, hand sanitizers. Uh, think of mints, you know, the, the, the supplier you're using, do they uh, adhere to the FDA practices? Do they, uh, and regulations, do they, they uh, have inspections? Uh, or are they just importing the products and sending them out? That's critical information that you want to know. Um, the biggies in state regulations generally, t lead, cadmium, things like that, but packaging as well, and we'll touch more on packaging later. Uh, and then there's international standards if you ship overseas. We have uh, more information than that in another session. So really, summing all that up, now that if I haven't scared you too much or, or, or made you want to run and, and hide, uh, bury your head somewhere and hide from all this, um, we're going to just touch these, taking all that together, here, here's the things that be concerned about. In our industry, like I said earlier, we transform general-use products, which are in products intended for adults. We transform them into a children's product. The minute we put Nora the Explorer, Nickelodeon, Disney, um, anything that is, that, that is child-friendly creates child appeal, and we give it to a child as the intended audience. Uh, so discovering that intended audience is difficult, and we, we have tools available at PPAI that you can use to, to kind of really get the root of where this product is going and how it's going to be used so that you can head things off at the pass and be the expert for your customer. Uh, and another thing is, far too often the test reports when people are asking for them in our industry, they're based on wrong standards or incomplete or different product. Those reports are good for a year uh, unless a modification has been made to the product, then they, will, those, they, they can be invalidated sooner. Uh, and then additionally, uh, they can be, on a positive side, they can be longer if a company has gone through for ISO certification. The test reports can go out uh, even further in some cases. Uh, again, that's something we will cover more in depth in other sessions, but just know that you typically get a test report that's two, three, four years old, uh, especially older. You're generally not going to accept that test report. That's, that's not, uh, that's not going to protect you if there's ever an incident. Uh, and as I said, distribution site, often unknown. You need to know the distribution channel as a distributor, and you must share that with your suppliers. Uh, so what can you do? I kind of talked on it as we did. You know, you're doing it today. You're learning about the various regulations. I encourage you to continue to learn about the regulations. Uh, as much education as you can get in the area. Now, you don't have to be an expert. Uh, don't run out and think, how am I going to fit all this into my day? We have the tools. We're there to help you, and we, we can help guide you through this process. Uh, and then at the end of the day, you take all this information, you build compliance into your programs, whether supplier or distributor, how you go to business, how you make products, how you decorate, how you um, vet suppliers, vet customers, how you call on people. Build this all into your uh, uh, your daily activity. You're basically going to increase the value you bring to the supply chain uh, and all partners involved, and you're going to make yourself as well as um, everyone in our chain a, a hard target. So with all of this, how can you tell if something's a children's product? One, we have best practices in place for you to help you do that. Our testing partner, UL, can help you with that, as well as other test labs can help you. Uh, we can help you sometimes uh, guide you in the right direction at PPAI. We have to be careful. We cannot give you, uh, tell you how to do things or what to do, but we can give you the best practices and help guide you along that journey. Um, so really, many of the new requirements apply specifically to children's products when we're talking to 
PSIA, um, these, which means they're designed or intended primarily for use by children. So you have to create filters somewhat to go through this and make a determination as to whether the product you're selling would truly become a children's product uh, or not. Uh, if it's not, it's not just toys, but also t-shirts and hats, cups, water bottles, sunglasses, furniture, and numerous other items. The word primarily in the CPSIA definition does not help take some out of, does help take uh, some items out of the children's product category, such as general use pens and other writing instruments. They're in most cases exempt from all of this. Uh, determining the category of a product isn't always easy. It's especially a challenge, as I've been saying, in our industry. So, you know, often in our industry, you know, promotional products which are intended for given out at trade shows and workplaces uh, end up in the hands of children. That doesn't necessarily make it a child's product. Uh, but, uh, you know, you need to be aware of that distribution channel. It doesn't mean that anything could be doesn't mean that anything could be a children's product, but it does mean that a determination as to its appeal and perceivable use by a child needs to be considered when manufacturing and or distributing a promotional product. While it's the responsibility of the manufacturer, the importer of record or supplier to ensure the compliance, it's the end distributor also needs to ensure that the product complies with appropriate requirements or regulations, and so you should be getting proof of that from your suppliers. But, you know, also think of things like appeal in the media. How has the item typically been marketed? Is it typically marketed to younger children? You know, you need to consider all of those things. Uh, other things to consider are the size of a product, uh, how it's sold on a website. The minute you put on a website a, a picture of a kid interacting with it or you put four children, take an item and you're turning it into. You're saying, you're broadcasting the world that it's a children's product. But you may have put undue restrictions on that. And I'll give an example of that later here in the session. Um, do they have play value, children or, or not? Keep that in mind. Color. Um, when I look at color, function, materials, non-realistic, I think a calculator is sold every day in our industry. It's pretty much obvious to where they go, but there are children's calculators. So while in most cases what we're selling in the industry uh, isn't a children's product and it may not be transformed into a, an industry product, a similar product like a Fisher and Price calculator, which, you know, uh, large, has huge buttons, bright colors, yellow, red, green, blue, all over it, that's obviously a uh, intended for children. And so you need to not only just understand from looking at it, but then how it ends up being used. And uh, so it, it's, I, I tell people it's about filters. You need to, through this stuff, don't try to get too hung up on everything, but have filters and apply common sense and read. Other things you want to look at are, are, are typical theme. Uh, you know, something that for many of us that we played with in our youth has now become an iconic uh, uh, item, and it's more uh, it's a collector's item. It's sitting on shelves. So what was a child's product at one time may not be a child's product today. In other cases, uh, it's still a popular child's product. But understand how it's used and, and how it's marketed. So here's some examples. We're going to run through these, and these will kind of give you ideas of what I'm talking about. Uh, we have a Flintstone mouse pad, a Flintstone deck. And, and, and for all intents and purposes, these are general use products. You do not have to worry about it. Uh, I really don't think you'd ever have to worry too much about the checkbook. But the, uh, the mouse pad, if you take that mouse pad um, and you and it has uh, a current image on it of a, of a um, cartoon character, and it's given to kids um, directly, you, you have to think to consider there. You need that possibly into a children's product. But as this stands, um, this was, uh, these are icons from way back in art in, in, in another generation. It's a mouse pad typically purchased by adults. Yes, kids may use it, but they're not the target audience. Uh, and so in most cases, you'd be safe in something. But that's something, you know, you need to filter through. I'm not telling you it's 100%, but I'm giving you a lens to filter it through. Hello Kitty here is, a, is another example. We have a youth t-shirt here uh, in the gray, and we have a, a more of a woman shirt on the right. Iconic character. The iconic character could protect it from being considered a, a, a children's product and the fact that uh, it's, it's just sitting there. But what you have here is 
the minute it's on the U shirt, it becomes a product. Mickey Mouse. Um, if you look at the quality of these two products, one looks plastic. It looks like it's not uh, very expensive. It doesn't look like it has a, a lot of value to it. The one on the right, uh, much, it looks heavier. It looks stronger. Um, you know, you could view, you filter these types of things. This is where we're talking similar products and where could it end up? What would be the intent uh, and those types of things? So filter it through it. As these boats stand here, they could be considered general use. Uh, that you got an argument could be made for children's product. The thing with Disney, though, the way Disney treats it is, if it has Disney on it, it's being tested to the PSIA standard and a discussion. So they themselves have said, we don't care if it's an adult item or not. Our brand, our image is so important, we're going to make them make everything apply to it. Then you have other themes for children. The, uh, the, the drawstring bag, and we'll talk more about drawstring bags in a minute, uh, in and of itself, there's no, there's no issues. It's a general use item. Uh, the cooler on the le bottom left, same thing. We have a, uh, a drawing board here. We have another mouse pad. We have a T-shirt. When you have children's themes here on adult products, so that's where you start changing them. That's where it starts. Um, uh, the, the dynamics change and the rules change, and we have to be aware in the promotional product industry. As I said, we're going to talk about quickly about string backpacks. As it stands today, a drawstring backpack is a general use product. Uh, we have the Chicago Bear logo on there, we have Dollywood, we have Pooh Bear. Um, you know, when those are typically given out, it's an adult product. Uh, the minute you know the intended audience is children, uh, not mixed between children and adults and not adults, uh, the parameters start to change. And then when you add in something like Pooh Bear and you target those children, again, you're ma you, you, now you're starting to uh, it back to the, uh, the under 12 crowd, the 12 and under crowd. So be aware of that, the intended use, where it's going. But generally, these items, string backpacks, are general use items. It's what we do with them on our end that can transform them. Same goes for sports apparel. In most cases, even though this one blanket here looks all cute with the teddy bear, that's unless it's truly advertised as a baby blanket or something like that and is intended for soothing, this could be the, uh, a blanket sitting on the couch for the family, and it's considered a general use item. Uh, when we're looking at the shirts, you're, you're talking youth apparel versus large apparel, and that's a differentiating factor. Um, things you want to consider is when you're giving it away at a, a ball game. If it's a general giveaway to everybody, um, both adults and children attending the game, it's going to more than likely be uh, considered a, uh, a, a general use product. But if the, we have the Orioles up on the screen here, if they or any other uh, major league team says we're going to have a kid day glove giveaway and everybody comes in, gets uh, whether a water bottle or a shirt, and it or the first 500 kids that come in and get it, your target audience is kids. You're 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 marketing it to kids. You're giving it primarily to kids. You're transforming that general use item into a, a children's product. Again, filters. Just keep going through these filters. The same with lunch bags, other totes. It, it just applies. So we're just giving you examples. We got everything here from a giraffe to Batman to truly a woman's uh, a, a cooler here or bag, and then we have Budweiser. So you, when you when you look at this stuff, understand where it's going and what the intended by your customer. And water bottles, the same mentality. And we have one here that says this seven-year-old rocks. The intended audience there. Um, Applebee's. Kids that come in Applebee's could leave with that, but at the same time, if it's given out to everybody and it's not targeted to children, the kids can leave and it's treated as a general use product. Um, if they start saying every child that comes in, we give this to them, now that's, that changes the parameters. Uh, but there's several filters you need to run that. And stress toys create a lot of angst for everyone in the industry. Many of our suppliers are just treating them as, as toys. Uh, to protect everyone involved, but uh, a lot of times the way they're given out and the way they're primarily intended is for adults, marketed to adults, uh, advertised to adults, but the bottom line is at the end of the day, they go home and they're handed to kids in cases. So while you, from a general use standpoint, you meet all the things, you may not be breaking the law, sometimes it's better to just err on the side of caution, but that's up to each uh, distributor and supplier to handle as, as you see fit. 
but again, run things through filters. Keychains, same way. Keychains are general use, even though they're cute here. But if you decide to take these cute ones um, and, and direct them towards children, again, that's when you start changing the parameters deliberately. Uh, and uh, whether you do it with a logo or uh, advertising uh, or the intended audience. Uh, pens and pencils. In most cases, writing instruments, as I said earlier, um, receive some exemptions. They're considered a general use. Um, you know, the toy-like attachment that's normally considered primarily for children, 12 and under, you know, that's at the top. Depending on how you're distributing it and who you're targeting, um, that, that, that determines whether it stays general use or not. One rule of thumb I like to say is, if you as an adult um, take something into a business meeting and be embarrassed, or would you be okay using it? That's kind of how would I apply this, and then treat that also as one of your filters. Um, these may serve a great purpose within the business setting or conference, but um, would you take it into the boardroom? Uh, USBs, for all intents and purposes, are typically uh, an adult use item. It, it is rare that you're going to make that uh, a children's product. However, if you on the Lego one, well, yes, Legos are a children's product. Um, it may or may not have to meet the requirements if, because it's a USB. Had it not been for this notation of USB for kids, the minute this person put this on their website, they forced themselves into the requirement uh, by uh, of all CPSIA regulation by they themselves announcing. And I mentioned earlier about sporting goods. Here, this product would generally be considered a family game, uh, it's a toy, uh, but you're advertising it with a kid. So once you start advertising it with a child, using it, uh, you're conveying the message that this is a child product, so it's going to uh, have to meet the regulation. Um, additionally, with, with other types of sporting goods, we have the Little Gym versus Budweiser. Understand how you're marketing it, where you're giving it. Um, are you giving the little gym one to the parents of everybody that comes in, or are you giving it to the kids? You know, you, there's there's different ways to filter this. The Budweiser one is pretty obvious. I doubt anybody's going to hand it with that on there and, and, and market it to the children. Um, and basketball, or I say soccer balls here. This could be the same for basketballs, peewee football, etc. You have a regulation size ball that is exempt. So even if children use it, buy it. Whatever, uh, a regulation ball is um, is going to be considered a general use item. But if you have kids that play soccer, you know that there's a size 3 ball and a size 5 ball, or I mean a size 4 ball. These are specifically intended for children under 12 as they're learning, and those now, those sporting goods, must meet the regulation. So I hope that helps you as your building. And executive desk toys. We, uh, we have a best practice on, on executive desk toys as well as a, a webinar session uh, on our website that, on demand that covers this. But look at how it's being used. Look at the expense to it compared to it. Even though it has some play value, is this adult play value, kid play value? Where is it going to sit? What's going to happen with it? Packaging material, logos, is it aimed at a children or at an adult, or is it aimed at children? Uh, fragile, expensive, those types of things. All those are filters you need to run. And I know we're coming up on that, that, that hour, so we're actually getting into the part of the session where I'm going to give you a tool to, to help you through this. So um, hopefully I'll get it done in the next five or six minutes. Um, but as I mentioned a few times in this session, we have the tools to help you. We have a wealth of knowledge on our website. Um, this is prior to me even coming in, becoming involved uh, or an employee of the AI. Uh, I used to refer to the website all the time. Uh, we do have a struggle right now is that the content has grown quickly for what uh, the layout is, and we have a new improved site that should be coming out in the next month or two. Uh, I would dare say three months smack pushing myself, but uh, we, we have new content reformulated the layout in a way that uh, you'll be able to navigate and find what you want a lot easier. I'll admit right now it's not the easiest to find, but I will tell you, if you either reach out to us, we can help guide you through it, uh, or you spend some time looking around, we're going to find a wealth of information to help you. Um, 
whether it's social responsibility, environmental responsibility, product responsibility. We have died, frequently asked questions, uh, best practices, case studies, many articles, test protocols, international standards, um, many things, uh, and, it's just, and, and tools you can use that I'll even tell you here that are uh, a bonus of, you know, kind of a value add for your membership. Uh, so on this page, when you actually go right now, currently into the main page, is our product safety aware program. In January, the product safety aware program was, was uh, announced at Expo. Um, this uh, program is part of a larger PPAI initiative to create confidence in promotional products as an advertising medium at all levels. Um, the, the awareness program helps position the medium as powerful and safe. You know, our, our medium, you know, our promotional products media is a powerful and safe marketing strategy. Uh, it, 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 we're currently focused on education, which this is part of. And as part of the program, all industry companies want to gain access to the AI marketplace, trade show exhibiting space, sponsorships, advertising. They must obtain the product safety aware status. Uh, even if you do not exhibit, uh, sponsor or advertise through PPAI. This, this program is going to create confidence for you. It is designed as an industry-wide program. It was designed for everyone uh, and distributors who really jump on board with it, who are going to benefit greatly uh, in your value, your overall knowledge, and expertise in the go-to service for customers. Um, with, uh, you know, basically, we encourage everyone to take this. It consists of three required programs, one of them which is the one we're at today, Product Based Basic, is a required element. And we have Propositions 5, 8 Reg, which I will be presenting at uh, the MIP show, in addition to Undo and Strain, uh, which basically deals with technical world standards that really working with testing for your third-party testing environment. Uh, those three components, and I'll offer that as well at uh, MIP show. Those are your three required. Then we have a host of elective sessions uh, that you can attend live or in person or on demand on the website. Um, you have live webinars, um, on demand webinars, and you have live in person sessions that you can attend and pick whichever ones you want that are in a, the bucket for product responsibility to get your four classes. Um, so please check out our website or free Feel free to reach out to me if you would like to learn more about that. If you've already got the first class done here, if you've taken some classes in the past, check the transcript. It may already be uh, there or close to completing it. At the end, we actually send you a logo to use with all your marketing materials on your website, in your booths, uh, on your business cards to announce to your customers and everyone else that you have gone through this program. And I want to, I want to stress here, this is not a certification. Uh, we're not offering, this is not like the MAS and CAS certification, but what it is is an awareness program. And so the vir virtue of that logo, you're just uh, promoting that you are aware of what your obligations and responsibilities are, and you've taken them seriously and have participated in, in further ed education. So when I talked about some great tools, TurboTest, uh, if you, there's, there's some popular software out there in the retail market um, that, uh, uh, that may come to mind when you talk about this. And essentially what this does, uh, our, our turbo test walks you through everything I talked to today and everything that's in other programs. You go into this, if you're a PPAI member, you can go in and it asks you a series of questions. And depending on how you answer the question, it will take you on to additional questions. And at the end, you will essentially get a uh, nice little printout uh, summary uh, that, that can help you decide what you need to do with it. So when you go in, here's, here's, here's a, uh, a question. You know, in its undecorated state, is this item generally considered a child's product? You can put yes, no, I don't know, and, depending, and then you hit next, and depending on how you answer it, it's going to give you another series of questions. And you're going to go through that. Here's, here's some more. Um, and what you do is when you click, it gives you information based on how you answered and then taking you into the next question and how you'll, you'll go on. Uh, at the end, here you get, you know, you get the nice summary, and it kind of helps you walk through. This isn't the end-all, be-all. This is not going to be something you say, okay, I did this, we're good to go. What this will do is help suppliers and distributors uh, communicate better and decide what 
what standards they should be discussing, what, what really uh, realistically should and should not apply in this instance, so you make a good informed uh, We also have, when you're asking for test reports, and I talked about be wary of the test report you get, we have a best practice on our website that will walk you through how to read uh, compliance documents. And we have an example of a good sample report with all the call-outs that you see here. We take you right to the area of what you're looking for, and we have an example of everything here for a good test report and a bad test report. So you bump this up against something you receive uh, from your manufacturer overseas, from your supplier here domestically. Uh, so whichever side of the aisle you're on, you have something to, uh, to compare it to because there are certain requirements. The, the location of the testing taking place, the regulation it was uh, tested to, a picture of the item being tested, all of that is a requirement and um, uh, uh, on, on a test report. And so this will help you. Uh, and, and here's another, this is an awesome tool. This right here uh, is great for distributors. This uh, is an end user friendly document that you can take out and helps you drill down who the intended audience is for a campaign, uh, whether or not it's going to be distributed, the product's going to be distributed to children, um, how uh, the overall distribution method is going to be, um, where it's going to be distributed, the type of logo, the intended use, um, whether you're not, whether somebody's going to keep the items on their shelf for a long time, or distributed all at once, depending on the program. Uh, a series of questions here to help you have this conversation with your end buyers in a way that's not going to scare them. Uh, and, and, and help you add value, and then you take these answers to all of this, and you go back to your supplier, and you guys have great open uh, dialogue at that point uh, to, to get through this. And that, again, that's available on our website. Print off any options you want or need. So, some takeaways here today at this point. Uh, most pens are general use, keep that in mind. Uh, always think before you include a picture of a child interacting with an item on your website or in your advertising. Look for tracking labels. Though there's no one-size-fits-all solution, um, but look for tracking labels. Be aware. Uh, understand what your obligations are and ask all the right questions. Test reports, as I said, should include pictures. Um, if it is a children's product, ask the CP. You know, ask for the uh, children's product certificate, the CPC. Um, you are entitled to ask for that. If somebody doesn't want to give you that, um, that's a red flag. Uh, and don't be upset at the same time. If you call your supplier and you say, uh, I want to sell this product to the elementary school, we're giving it out to all the kids, and they say, we have not tested that product for uh, the CPSIA standards and we're not comfortable selling it to them, to selling it to you for that use, uh, you wouldn't believe uh, the backlash that some suppliers get over this. You have a good supplier, an open, honest supplier that just protected you, the end client, the end user, everybody involved, and they should be they should be applauded. So, uh, you, what you do is you work with them to say, okay, what what similar products do you have that we can uh, say have met the requirements? Unless you have time and want to pay for the testing yourself. So, uh, drawstrings. We have a session that we'll go through um, a few weeks here at the show that uh, goes much deeper into drawstrings. But basically, drawstrings, they're a big no-no. Just avoid it. Uh, don't take uh, the example of a very common retailer that has consistent calls out there for these. Uh, hefty fines are associated with this. They are a hazard. Uh, so keep in mind, drawstrings bad. Ask your screen printers for ink test reports. You can't rely on current ink test reports. Um, look for secondary tracking labels. Uh, and and even, even if the item is a general use item, there may be regulations beyond CPSIA, like Proposition 65 or other state, uh, state laws that could apply. Um, one more thing here I want to you note, know, uh, our Product Safety Summit, I briefly mentioned that, I believe, earlier. Uh, it's coming up in Boston. If you have a chance to go, I attended the previous three as a distributor in the, in, in the past. I believe it's one of the best events the industry has to offer. It, tremendous work networking opportunities with a host of industry experts. Uh, we have government officials there. We have a CPSC commissioner giving a talk. We have a previous commissioner giving a talk. We have lawyers from California giving uh, talks. We, we're going to address tech products. We're going to address the FDA. 
Um, we're going we're gonna to talk about setting up programs that make sense of all this and how to protect yourself. We're going to talk about recalls. Two days of awesome information. Please visit our website if you, you uh, think you could have the opportunity to come join us. It's a tremendous uh, event. Uh, also, as I've been saying, the final three sessions for Product Safety Aware, I'm going to present the elective that we are going to address is focus on apparel and spirit wear, where we're going to talk about t-shirt decorating, uh, drawstrings, and those sorts of things. So we will, that's the elective we're offering at MIPA, in addition to Prop 65, state regulations, along with undue influence. Um, and we'll go much deeper into those things at that time. So uh, I went uh, five minutes over at this point. Here's some additional resources, and I'm going to give you one more that's not listed here. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter. Uh, it's at promo safety guy all one word so that's at promo safety guy uh, i put updates out there as to what's going on i let you know of things that are coming down the pike uh, different things like that i'll make you aware of recalls anything that i find is worthwhile and somebody might find interesting as far as compliance uh, I, I put out there so feel free if you're on twitter follow me um, there so with that, I'm going to leave this page up for another second. I'll answer questions, and then I'll flip over to a contact page where you can get uh, that, that Twitter handle again, as well as my contact information and, and Ann Lardner Stone's contact information. She's my director at PPAI, and uh, we're will, happy, willing, uh, thrilled to happy, help you in any way possible. So with that, Paul, I guess we can uh, turn it over to some questions, and I'll do my best to okay. answer them if I can. I'll get back to anybody uh, at a later date. Uh, very early on, you talked about distributors and uh, direct direct sourcing. Um, someone asked if you could give a better def definition of direct sourcing. What do you mean when you're you're talking about direct sourcing? Yeah, direct sourcing um, is basically you cut the supplier out of the the mix if you're a uh, distributor. You go over to um, China uh, or you know you go over to Asia anywhere. Um, around the globe, and you source that product direct yourself. Now, you may choose to do that yourself um, through different media, intermediaries. You may go to a, a, a known broker, but you are the one who's responsible. You're acting as the manufacturer as a order of that, even though you may use an intermediary on your behalf. You're the one responsible for it. You're the one who's seen as the importer of record. Um, there are sourcing companies within our industry um, that uh, do this, and they are they act as the importer of record. Uh, so you look at them, uh, their list of suppliers in our industry, or you uh, the standard suppliers that also have um, custom operations overseas. But when I talk about direct sourcing, that is cutting out the typical supply chain to go overseas by yourself. Do it. You then take on all. The Okay, um, I had this when I was a distributor working with, with large uh, national companies with, with big brands, and, and that was the suppliers and didn't want to give test reports because they, they show the name of the factory and the contact information of the, the factory, particularly for suppliers that are dealing with distributors that they may know go direct or uh, sometimes buy direct. Um, one of our participants asked, is it ever okay to black out that that factory information, or is it necessary? Oh, um, I know that uh, there's certain information that is required on the test. Um, the uh, which, which and there's a lot of uh, discussion around this. What uh, I would like to do is firm that up, and maybe I can give you an answer that you can send out to all participants afterwards. But to my understanding, and as the importer of record, you're being responsible for that information that you can say who, who that you know, you're, you're the importer of record, you can put your name in there, you can put that it was, you know, maybe it was tested in Shanghai uh, or Shenzhen or somewhere, as long as that accurate information is on there, and uh, uh, you're the importer of record, you have the testing lab that did it over there and all their information, you're, you're covering it. And I don't believe you necessarily black it out, but um, uh, the information has to be there so it's trackable back and validated and verified. But if the factory themselves, if they were acting on your behalf, and I want to confirm this, um, 
who is the importer of record kept your name in there, um, the test report yourself. I do not believe uh, with a degree of certainty that uh, you check stuff out on there. You start getting into okay. I will, I will verify. Okay. Uh, waste about children's clothing that um, there needs to be a tracking label printed on it? Yep. It is a requirement uh, for children's products that a tra tracking label. When the manufacturer um, sent, makes that product originally, they have the, the information contained in there somewhere, as well as they should have a CP that uh, goes with that, which you are entitled to. Um, when you add the ink to it or other decoration, you have to. Um, uh, have that that as well. You need to um, have those test reports and that information and then add a secondary tracking label that handles that material change to the product. And, and when I cautioned earlier about the embroidery threads, here's, here's, a, here's a funny instance with that. The embroidery threads are exempt from testing, so you don't necessarily need a testing report for the embroidery threads. But because you embroidered the children's product and made a material change, a, set, a a, a tracking label has to be included in the product for uh, that material change. Now you raise the question, well, how do I do that? Do I do it with ink on the inside of the shirt, which now I have to make sure my ink <laughs> meets the requirements? Is that another tracking label? There's, it, it's, it's a little confusing. Um, I, I definitely, we got best practices on our website to walk you through it. I don't want to go too deep into it today. I'm happy to talk to anybody, you know, kind of offline. And, and so is our test lab, as well as, uh, you know, we can get you the, the best practices to help you make those decisions and how people are doing it. Okay. Um, I've moved over to the screen contact information on it, Tim, and, and your Twitter handle at Promo Safety Guy. Um, and would like to thank you for sharing your knowledge. Uh, we're really excited to have you come, coming in on August 20. Um, that's the Wednesday before the Ideas in Bloom show in, in Grand Rapids. Uh, there's information at the MIPA.org website um, on that and a place where you can pre-register for petition. As a bonus uh, for going through the additional three hours and getting your um, uh, being product safety aware, we're also offering free tickets on our craft beer tour um, that starts at 6 o'clock that night and is going to be visiting three of the top craft breweries in the country here in Grand Rapids. So um, after full four hours of product safety, I think everybody will be ready for a beer. Um, also, uh, 20 <laughs> and also on the 21st, uh, Thursday the 21st is Ideas in, in Bloom. It's a tabletop show at Frederick Meyer Gardens and, and Sculpture Park, one of the most uh, prestigious and, and most beautiful um, botanical gardens in the country and with a fantastic collection of world famous uh, sculptures. Fantastic venue for a show. We've got over 85 tables and, uh, of the best suppliers and, and reps in the business. So you're not going to want to miss that because we're also starting that, kicking that day off with uh, no, none other than Cliff Quicksell on, on how to uh, do self promotion. So Really exciting time in Michigan in August in Grand Rapids, and a lot of good reasons to come. If you're in the uh, Flint, Saginaw Bay City area, tomorrow we're having a free luncheon at Zenders of Frankenmuth, uh, world famous chicken dinners, and four great suppliers presenting uh, lots of great ideas there. Uh, at next month's Wild Wednesday webinar, we're featuring Danny Rosen from Brand Fuel. Uh, Danny speaks on a related topic, corporate social responsibility, how doing good is good for business, and it's a great Wild Wednesday webinar coming up for that. Also, uh, in September of the 19th, we're having a tour of the Bodican Roads uh, Distribution Center in Niles, part of our Smitten with the Mitten factory tour sessions. Great opportunity for you to see how uh, uh, orders get processed. And not only that, you get a free sample um, order in your size that you get to watch walk through the entire process. And on our Wild Wednesday webinar in uh, September is going to be featuring the always entertaining and uh, informative Ronnie Wright from the book company. And of course, October 15th, we're very excited about the first end user booth show at Nana Field, home of the Detroit Lions. Uh, promotions that roar. We've got uh, Paul Ballantone from PPAI as our speaker. We've got stadium tours. We've got uh, corporate suites that 
distributors can rent for entertaining their clients. It's going to be just a great, great day of uh, lots of excitement there. So lots of good things happening in, in Michigan and MIPA. Once again, Tim's uh, presentation, you can download it. To, uh, if you go to the left side of the screen, very top, there's a place where you can click, click to download his presentation. His uh, contact information is on the screen. Feel free to contact him and also plan on coming to our show in August where you can uh, get the additional three hours to get your product safety aware. Um, uh, it's not a, not a certification, but a designation. And uh, speaking designations an early adopter of uh, product safety aware apothecary products is our sponsor for these wild wednesday webinars so this has been recorded it will be up on the um, MIPA facebook page as soon as it's rendered i apologize for some of the audio issues that we had today it has to do with the bandwidth on the internet and uh, unfortunately there was nothing we can do with it but uh, about that but hope you enjoyed today's session and look forward to seeing you at a future wild wednesday webinar Thanks a lot, Tim, and thanks, everyone. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Goodbye, everyone.